Okay, so welcome. This is the first lecture for what will be showing up on the second exam. We're going to be talking about monetary policy and time and consistency. So what, what is the problem of, uh oh, there's some stuff with the mic here. Okay, what is the problem of time and consistency? Well, it's basically when in one period you have every incentive in the world to say that you're going to do something and then, well, time comes to, you know, actually make good on said promise and you have no incentive to do it anymore. Example, if you have siblings, you know, I'm sure you and your siblings have fought in the past, and, you know, siblings like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to kill you if you do whatever. But then, you know, you do it, and, I mean, obviously you're still alive. You're watching this video, so clearly there's, you know, an example of time inconsistency. Um, there are plenty of cases where you may have every incentive in the world to say that you're going to do something at some point in time, but when it comes time for you to do it, you don't want to anymore. So that's time and consistency. Now, how is this relevant in the realm of monetary policy? How is this relevant in monetary economics? Well, there was a long-standing belief that the monetary authority, central bank, Federal Reserve, could announce a certain type of policy, renege on that policy in the future, and ultimately trick the public into engaging in ways that would boost output above its natural rate. Now, this has been refuted across the board in, well, in the last probably 30, 40 years now. But before that, it was a very long-standing belief, and it's one of the things that helped lead to stagflation in the 1970s, where we had near double-digit inflation and extremely high unemployment. So we're going to be talking about a game theoretical model where the central bank has an incentive to announce a policy of a certain type, namely zero inflation, to get the public to prepare for zero inflation and then trick them with higher inflation than what they were expecting, which then leads to a short boost in output. We're going to be looking at multiple uh, expectations, hypotheses, expectational structures, namely rational expectations and adaptive expectations. Now we'll see in this model, it works under adaptive expectations where basically everybody is born dumb and naive. And as they get tricked more and more, they update their information set every single period and eventually wise up and realize what's going on. Contrast that with rational expectations where everybody has perfect and complete information of what every other player in a game is going to do at the beginning of the game. So under rational expectations, if, say, you're playing Battleship with somebody, under rational expectations, if they're going to cheat in that game, you know they're going to cheat in that game. Under adaptive expectations, they'll cheat, and you'll eventually go, wait a minute, why is this person always winning, and why am I always losing? Because there really shouldn't be any reason for them to be winning as much as they are. Hmm, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're cheating. And then you kind of start to go, okay, well, either I'm going to cheat back or I'm just not going to play this person anymore. So that's sort of the way the rational and adaptive expectations thing can work. So let's just go ahead and get started with all this. Now, with time and consistency, we're going to be looking at what's known as the Phillips curve for output. All right, so we've got the current rate of output being a function of the natural rate of output plus deviations of actual inflation from expected inflation, where this alpha is the relationship that deviations in inflation has on increasing output, and then we're going to have an error term. This error term would be like the source of shocks to supply. So what would that encompass? Well, it could be like a technology shock, right? Like a shock to A sub T. That would show up in an aggregate supply type shock. We could also have a shock to labor supply. That would also cause a shock to aggregate supply. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and list off what these things are on the board, and then we're going to discuss how the central bank comes into this, because right now all we're looking at is just the public, right? So essentially this Phillips curve for output is a it's an aggregate supply curve where changes in inflation can affect production or output. And this is 
from the guy, presumably his name is Phillips, from 1958, who established a relationship between inflation and unemployment. Namely, if you were to increase inflation, you would decrease unemployment. In terms for output, what it means is if you were to increase inflation, theoretically, you should see an increase in output. However, the Phillips curve eventually broke down thanks to, well, one, policymakers trying to exploit the hell out of it, and two, the rational expectations hypothesis stuff that came out, the rational expectations uh, revolution, so to speak, that came out as a result of Lucas's critique on how some of these macroeconometric models were being used and applied in the real world and how they basically were just beginning to fall apart, sort of the death of the traditional Phillips curve. So we'll talk a little bit about that stuff. We'll talk about the central bank and the role that the central bank plays in all of this as well. So let's get going. I hope to God this mic can hear me from far enough away. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, this YT is the actual rate of output. All right, so this isn't output in levels. This is output in a rate. So when we're looking at all this stuff, because we're not looking at a price level, right? We're looking at a rate of change in the price level. Well, we're also thus looking at a rate of change in output. So just wanted to make that clear really quickly. Now, there is what's known as a natural rate of output. Excuse me. Under the natural rate of output, this is the rate of output that we would be seeing if there were no exogenous shocks to the system, right? If this epsilon t, which we'll talk about in a second, is zero, right? There are no shocks to the economy. If inflation does not deviate from what the expected inflation is, and we have all shocks being equal to zero, then output is just equal to its natural rate. So we can sort of think of that as kind of like a steady state. So these are like deviations from a steady state in the rate of output. So this pi sub t is actual inflation. So this is the, the yeah, yeah, sound it out, Jeremy. This is the inflation rate that is actually observed every period, right? This is the inflation that is experienced, that the economy gets hit with. But it's not just all about what the actual rate of inflation is. A lot of times it has to do with how that deviates from what people expected inflation to be. If you expect inflation to be zero, but then inflation becomes positive, your behavior changes a little bit. So if there's deviations in the overall outcome from what the ex expectation was of that. I don't know why I'm having a hard time speaking today. Um, if there are deviations in inflation from the expectation of inflation, well then, it's going to have some kind of an impact. So it's not just actual inflation that matters, but also the expectation of inflation. So let's talk about expected inflation for a minute. We're taking the expectation over inflation. What does that mean? Well, what it means is the expectations operator, that E of something, right, is, well, the expectation. What is the expectation of some random variable? Well, that the expectation of that is the mean. It's the average, right? So expected inflation is really just the average of inflation. Now, there are other operators that would show up, like if we wanted to get the variance, for example, right? The expectation would tell us, you know, the measure of central tendency. The variance, on the other hand, will tell us the dispersion, the spread around that. A wider variance means a wider distribution. So when we take the expectation of inflation, we can sort of think of that also as 
what the central bank is going to say inflation is going to be, right? Because if we assume, although this isn't always the case, if we assume for just a split second that the central bank has more information than the public does and they announce a certain upcoming policy for inflation, that means, okay, that we can expect what inflation is going to be based on what they've announced, All right? So the expectations operator gives us the mean or the average of a random variable because all of these variables that we're looking at are random variables, right? What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is they are variables that come from a distribution. They are subject to the laws of probability. Hence, they are random. They are not deterministic. So when we take the expectation of a random variable, you get the mean. So if that's the case, if we're looking at deviations of inflation from expected inflation, then this alpha is going to be telling us what that relationship is in terms of output. Right? How do these deviations in actual inflation from expected inflation affect production? So we can sort of think of that as this alpha is sort of like the slope of the aggregate supply curve. Now, in the real business cycle model, what you saw was a vertical aggregate supply curve. That's no longer the case here. What does this look like? Well, I'm going to put this in terms of rates just so we can sort of see what's going to be going on here, right? Whether we're looking at levels or rates in the RBC model, the aggregate supply curve is always vertical. It is independent of prices. Therefore, it's independent of the change in prices, right? Whatever the rate of output is under the real business cycle model, it will be entirely independent of the rate of change in prices within the real business cycle model. Okay. What's going on here though? Well, Here, we have an upward sloping aggregate supply curve. The aggregate supply curve here is upward sloping because now, if there are changes in anything with the price level, thus inflation, because the rate of change of the price level gives me inflation, if there's a change to inflation, there will be a change in output. So what's going on is that when inflation deviates from its expectation, you can actually have some kind of a positive impact on production. Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. One, remember, remember what monetary policy shocks do. What side of the economy do they impact? Do they impact the demand side or the supply side? The goal is to have an effect on supply but it is not through supply that they want to operate. They want to operate via a demand shock. They want to shift the demand curve. So if we drew out aggregate demand in both of these, and there was a monetary policy shock, 
which then shifts demand out, well, what we'd see is here, we would actually have an increase in production if there's an aggregate demand shock. So that's sort of what the intuition is giving us here. Now we have an upward sloping aggregate supply curve, but we don't have aggregate demand in here. All right, we're looking purely at supply. So while this can sort of help you get sort of the intuition of what's going on, this is not entirely accurate in terms of what this model is telling us. So what is the model telling us? Well, what the model's telling us is that there are, we could say, informational asymmetries within the model. Namely, there's a big problem with what's known as signal extraction. Under a signal extraction problem, what's happening is agents are having a hard time um, reliably or getting reliable information about the state of the economy. Right? They're having a, for fear of circular logic here, they're having a problem in extracting signals in a proper way. There's difficulty in extracting a reliable signal when it comes to changes in price. And that is what's going to be driving output in this particular model. Right, so it's saying here is that what's determining the slope of the aggregate supply curve or the Phillips curve for output, what's determining that slope is actually a signal extraction problem that information is not being conveyed, it's not being extracted, it's not being uh, taken and used in a reliable way because, well, the information itself may not be reliable. And we'll see how that works in just a moment. But last thing to talk about here is this epsilon t. This epsilon t is a source of shocks. Every single period we can think of, there's this distribution of shocks, right? So let's look at what this might look like. Well, it has a mean of zero. And the variance, which determines the spread, is sigma squared. Every single period, right, if we've got this distribution of shocks, every single period, we draw from this distribution of shocks. And that draw, just, it's just a random draw from that shock, or from that distribution of shocks, that produces a shock to the actual rate of output. Now, if it's mean is zero, its expectation is zero. So the expectation, again, is still just the mean, it's the average. The expectation of epsilon is zero, which means on average, we can expect 
shocks to just be zero. Right? We can base our decision making on what this thing is on average. That is equal to zero on average. Now the spread of that also matters, but we're not gonna, I'm not gonna be too concerned about that. You'll see why in just a few minutes. So this is the structure, this is the construction of the Phillips curve for output. So with the construction of the Phillips curve for output, this is going to conclude this particular video. The next video that's coming up is going to talk about the central bank's utility function, why the utility function is the way it is, and then we're going to talk about how the Federal Reserve or the central bank maximizes their utility and what that means in terms of changes to output. So thank you for watching this video. There's another one coming shortly.